Thank you for checking out this movie review. Uh, so I went to see the 40th anniversary theatrical re-release of Alien, the original Alien film from 1979, uh, done directed by Ridley Scott and written by, I believe, Dan O'Bannon, I think was the guy who wrote the script, which, by the way, the script is great. Um, so there will be spoilers in what I'm talking about, so if you have not seen the film yet within the 40 years that it's been out, go watch it first, then come back and watch this, So, because I will be doing spoilers with that. The other thing is I didn't take notes for this, because since I was in a theater, I'm not going to be that person who's got my phone out with that bright screen, you know, taking notes while people behind me are getting distracted by the brightness of my screen. I hate it when people do that. So everything I'm going to talk about is just off the top of my head what I remember since I just saw the film. So uh, I may miss some things that I want to say, but, you know, I'll do the best I can. Uh, I am wearing my Alien shirt that I got from my Fright Crate, which is amazing. Watch that unboxing. It it wasn't this past one, but I think it was like the one before that or before that one. I don't know. You'll see. Anyway, so Alien, for everyone who's seen it knows, this is a highly revered sci-fi horror film. Uh, I think I think it's, you know, appropriately called a sci-fi horror film. Actually, a lot of times it's mainly just called a sci-fi film, but it's definitely more horror than people will give it credit for. And I think a large part of that just being the industry consistently not wanting to recognize horror as being as legitimate as it is as a genre. So they kind of tr tend to sanitize the horror aspect from it. Which, speaking of sanitized, watching this film again on the big screen... It's one of those moments where you, you think you remember the film being a lot more gory than it actually is, and that's something that I've seen talked about on some documentaries and, and in some uh, writings about horror uh, and how people experience horror movies, is it, that your mind will just naturally fill stuff in. So if you see a film from some time ago, if you see a film and then some time passes, like your 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 brain will just fill in the gore like you think it was there but it wasn't actually there and a lot of times when it's just alluded to and re-watching Alien I had that situation going on where I was just like I swore there was more gore in this but no it's things that are just alluded to like when the little extra mouth comes out of the alien's mouth and like gets people it doesn't actually show it it just shows it coming out and it kind of like shows a quick flash of something alluding to the fact that someone got it so there really is I don't even think there's any actual blood in this other than the chest burster, burster scene which is obviously iconic everyone knows about that it was spoofed in space balls marvelously by the way I loved it and when I was watching this right now when I just watched it today I was like when the chest burster scene happened it just made me think of the version in space balls and I was just like yeah they did a great job parodying it it was pretty awesome so let's talk about some main themes of this well actually no off the first let's talk about the technical stuff so directed extremely well Ridley Scott did an amazing job with this acting awesome Sigourney Weaver Yafa Koto John Hurt Harry Dean Stanton um, Ian Holm can't remember everyone else in it but that's a pretty good smattering of people yeah great performances and one of the things is the dialogue in it, it feels real you know, there are a lot of times where I watch movies and the dialogue seems like someone wrote it, not like it feels natural. Within this and within the situation that people are in, the dialogue going on feels natural. And there's actually a lot of, like, conversational, laid-back stuff that's said that just feels natural and feels real. And part of that is how it's written, but part of it's also how it's acted. And that's where those two things really come together and are super strong in this film. Um, the music is wonderful it's this kind of really like it gives you the sci-fi feel of like being out in space and it, it's very kind of like mysterious but it also has these like notes here and there that are that are kind of like a horror note they're kind of dark and kind of gives you an idea that there's something bad about to happen at least early on and then it obviously gets a lot more heavy on the horror aspects and darkness as the film goes on so the music is amazing. The sound design is outstanding because there are a lot of times where, you know, you're in space, so you're not going to hear a lot of background noise. So they just put in these, like, the, the necessary noises, which a lot of it's just coming from, like, the ship and the people doing what they're doing. And it's just this cool, 
this cool thing when you when you kind of step back from it and really experience what's going on there that it's basically silent and all the noises that are being created are being created by this crew from the Nostromo. Um, it's either the actual mechanic mechanical aspect of the ship or it's the human organic people or the alien. So, and the cat Jones, you know? So, um, yeah, so that's great. The other really big thing with this, and I knew this going into the film from when I had watched the movie the last time, a bunch of years ago, it has been a while. Uh, but it becomes even more apparent when you see it in a, in a theater because it's so much larger of a screen, you can see a lot more. The set design for this film is unbelievably amazing. And when it's on a theater screen, you can just see m much more detail. And when they usually do these, they'll kind of like clean it up, they'll remaster it, they make it look brighter and clearer. And it's just, it looks unbelievable. My buddy who I went with, Rich Smith, shout out to Rich, um, he even said after we watched the film, he was just like, the way that looked was unbelievable. I didn't remember, remember it being like that crisp and it just looking that good. There was an, a, a wonderful use of kind of like lights and shadows in the film. Um, the set design is just unbelievably cool because not only does it make you believe that it's like a futuristic space setting with how the spaceship is designed, but it also just looks sleek. And it also looks sterile, which is really interesting because when the alien itself is introduced, it is, it's meant to be a sterile environment. Like they, they even talk about how they have protocol for quarantine because when the guy gets the initial face, face hugger after going into the old ship that had, well, that planet and the old ship that had, um, that had been left there and destroyed and uh, had all the eggs, the alien eggs in it and was sending out the warning signal, which they found out was a warning signal, which at first I was just like, when they were like, oh, we're deciphering this and it's not actually an SOS, it's a, it's a warning signal actually. And I was like, why wouldn't you have taken the time to decipher that first and then go check it out? Like that seems to not jive. But when you go further on and you realize that the character Ash is, that, um, is an android basically and he had this secret mission of like, who cares about the human beings? We're going to find a alien life form. Uh, you understand why that was the case, but from the humans on board, it doesn't make sense that they would just kind of go along with it. They're just like, Wah. but, um, but when the, when they have that moment where, you know, the guy gets uh cane is the character, he gets the face hugger and they're going, they're having a struggle and they're just like, you know, Ripley, Sigourney Weaver's character is like, no, the protocol is we need quarantine. They're not coming in. I'm not letting you in. Well, who lets him in is Ash because he's the android. He has a secret motive. But everyone else is 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 kind of gunning for it or, well, advocating for it, I should say, just saying, let him in, let him in, let him in. And that's this, this moment, this issue of like procedural and smarts and intelligence versus reactionary and emotional. And it's the difference between human and, you know, humanity doing logical things devoid of emotion so usually and this this is a big theme within this usually if you take the emotions out of it and sometimes have to take the morality out of it what makes the most sense to for making decisions is not what's most humane or most emotionally acceptable it is kind of cold honestly and that's why it's it's interesting that when Ash lets Cain and everyone in with the infected creature, well, with the infection, which is the creature who's laying its egg basically inside the guy at the moment, uh, Cain, um, it's seen as he's being the compassionate one. But he's not the compassionate one you end up finding out later. It's because he has a secret directive because he's supposed to get that creature. And it you definitely see at that moment that he's very much... Um, it seems that he's driven by, uh, being inquisitive and it seems like one of those, oh, this is going to go poorly. It's like curiosity killed the cat as he's just like, I have to take a look at this. I have to see what this is about. And that's what it seems like is he's very like science driven. Like it's his curiosity in trying to figure out what this thing is that's going to get everyone killed. <clears throat> but then, like I said, excuse me, 
And like I said, eventually you find out, no, it's because this was his directive and this is what he's supposed to be doing, is getting this, as he calls it, perfect being. Which he, like, it's interesting because he is envious of it. And the portion it feels like he's envious of is the being devoid of emotion. Because he does kind of talk about how it's, like, kind of, like, physically perfect. Because, you know, it's got acid blood which is a crazy idea for this film and good job on the writer of the script who I, th I said I think is Dan O'Bannon. Um, that's a really cool concept. So like with things like that, he's just looking at this and being like, oh, physically it's like evolved, it's perfect, it's got this defense mechanism, its body is like amazingly made and you know, all this stuff. But then when he's talking about how he envies it, it it's, it seems like it's more from the aspect of it not having emotions and it mainly acting like being physically perfect, but acting without emotion and without morals and more from an animal instinct aspect of things, which ties in with um, one of the, the, the main survivor from the film who is not actually Ripley. Really? It's the cat Jones who was doing just fine all by itself was able to get away from the creature because it's animal instinct versus animal instinct versus animal instinct versus humans who could go by instinct but then get let emotions get involved and, you know, they're not doing things logically. The cat's doing things logically. That's something that's a problem. I'm going away from it. Whereas the people are like, that's something that's a problem. We have to go look at it and study it and see what's going on with it. And that's what, you know, obviously creates the big issue there. So, um, yeah. So you can't really talk about this film, though, without talking about the fact that Ripley is a female, and Ripley is the main character, and Ripley is the hero, well, heroine of this. Now, initially when this film was made, Ripley was supposed to be a male. And I can't remember why it ended up changing, but it did change at some point, obviously. And it became very revolutionary, because this was the first time that people were seeing, oh, the hero of this thing is a woman. That's amazing. And you see kind of the, the male-female tension throughout the entire film where, you know, she's saying, technically, I'm in charge right now, and you need to listen to me. But all these males are like, okay, I think we should do this instead. And she's like, shut up. I'm the one who's technically in charge. If we're going by the rules, you should be listening to me right now. And it's important to point out, if you look at the film, as my buddy Rich said, the film would have been over within the first bunch of minutes um, or he just said the film would have been over really fast if everyone actually listened to her like they were supposed to because they wouldn't have let the creature on board and then things wouldn't have gone to crap like they totally did and the ship ended up needing to be blown up and Ripley had to abscond, well not abscond, had to escape into deep space with Jones. So literally the only people who, the only existing crew members at the end are the animal, Jones, who acted sheerly off of uh, animal instinct with some help from Ripley at the end. And Ripley, who was trying to follow the rules and take em human emotion and morality out of things and go by the book and the rules that were set to follow in their scenarios and no one else wanted to listen to it, those are the two who make it. So it it's basically has this big theme of human emotion and human morality getting in the way of survival a lot of the time. At least that's what comes through in this film, for me. Um, I really think the script is is outstandingly well-written. It's For nowadays, if they were to make this film, it would be a lot shorter, a lot more condensed. There wouldn't be as long as shots and takes of scenes as there are in it. But based off the substance and how good it looks and how good the practical effects are and the music and everything, the slow pacing for what it is now is still really effective because the tension stays. Because there's this consistent, like, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? And there's a lot of exploration that goes along with it as they're kind of going through the guts of the, of the uh, ship. Because they know where they're going within the ship, but you as a viewer don't know you haven't seen it. So it's just more of an exploration of that amazing set design that is just very, very visually pleasing. Uh, another thing is I really like how they used um, kind of the environment inside of, of the ship with, you know, when things are going wrong, like the flashing lights, which 
caution epileptics that'll that could set you off at some point uh there's a lot of like flashing with it which i think adds some extra horror aspects when the flashing is going on and the actual alien creature shows up the xenomorph which is another thing that's really important to talk about the xenomorph itself and the design of it done by hr giger who amazing artist unfortunately isn't around anymore if you want to see a really good documentary about him there's a documentary called Dark Star, and it's just a whole documentary about H.R. Giger. So he's most well known, obviously, for his design of the Xenomorph and working with, you know, the set and everything for um, for the movie Alien. But I think he also, a bunch of his drawings were referenced for, um, oh, why am I blanking on it? It was the prequel. Can't remember it right now. Pando no. I can't remember. People hated it, so it doesn't matter that I can't remember the name at the moment. At the moment, um, yeah. But I saw it. I didn't think it was that bad. But, but anyway. So the the design is key in this because it's this. It looks amazing, especially for being in the '70s. It seems kind of ahead of its time. It's this melding that Gear would always do in his work between mechanical and human, and that plays really well with the theme of the film. Like I was talking about, you know, you know, taking human emotion and taking morality out of things that's the mechanical aspect of things and then fusing it with the human portion of things which is the emotion and the morality and when you put those two things together you know what do you get so the design goes really well with a lot of themes in the film plus it just looks amazing it is unbelievable how good that creature looks and holds up today but it's not just there it's also in that ship that was uh downed on that planet where they originally find the alien eggs uh you see all of his his influence in the whole design of that as well and it still holds up like it still looks amazing right now like just the way they shot this i, I can't say it enough the set design in this is ridiculous ridiculous and it it holds up that's the thing and that's the problem with like nowadays when people want to make films and they want to make things so cg the problem is that cg is not going to hold up because cg will continually get better and it'll look better and it's always been like that so you know the some of these cg marvel movies that you're seeing right now in 10 years or so you're going to look back and you'll be like oh that doesn't look nearly as good as it does nowadays when they do cg for these marvel films because i assume they'll still be making them at that point but when you look at a practical effects film that's very well pulled off like Alien, it still holds up. You can look at it. You don't even need to think from the aspect of, oh, well, I need to keep in mind that this was shot in the 70s. No, it still looks great for now because it's practical, because it was physically there and it's not computer graphics. So, And that's another thing, speaking of computers, with this film, the whole thing where, they, where they're consistently going and checking in with the computer and it just seems like they want the computer to tell them what to do because it's like purely analytical and it's taking the emotion out of decision making. But it's also not helping because it's just being like, need more information, can't verify, need more information. Like, And it just made it seem like all these people, they just keep going to him. It's like, well, this is where I get my answers. And then they can't get an answer. So then they're just kind of clueless, except for Ripley being the hero who's like i know how we do this we think we put our brains together or since you guys don't want to put your brains together i'll tell i'll tell you what to do this is how we make it out of here and then jones acting off animal instinct doing just fine but anyway um i'm sure there are some other things i i had thought about talking about and then can't remember at the moment but i think i talked a bunch about it i'm almost at the 20 minute mark so i'm gonna leave it at that and i'm gonna say if if people have the chance when i'm putting this up there is an opportunity there are at least i think two more showings available of alien in the theater if you can find a theater that's doing it it's through fathom events so you can just check out fathomevents.com um i think the next one is the 13th which is wednesday i believe but look into it i would highly recommend it especially if you like the movie alien or think you might like the movie alien definitely check it out it is totally worth the experience like i said you could feel like you can get lost in that ship. You can get lost in the set design. There's so much to look at, and it's very visually pleasing. So it's it's a relaxing film. 
which seems weird to say <laughs> because it's uh, not relaxing. Like, it's unsettling, the subject matter, but from a visual standpoint, it is very relaxing. And the way the camera work, like, very slowly pans over all the beautifully crafted uh, environment there and set. So highly recommend it. Definitely check it out in the theater. Totally worth it. Uh, anyway, thanks everyone for checking this out. Please do me a solid really quick. If you like any of the videos I do, please hit that subscribe button. It takes you like a second and it's totally painless, but it means a lot to me and it keeps me moving, keeps me going. And it motivates me to do more things like this, you know, go to the theater, see a special screening of something and then come and tell you guys how it is. So, uh, but thanks once again for checking this out and until next time, keep it brutal.